Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to thank Louise for the beautiful tea mug she sent me. Well, I never I, had a China tea mug before. I like them too, but you know, I just have to have a little bit more. <laughs> half, a, half a gallon size. And I want to thank the Lewis family for sending us the scripture tea. Yeah. Versus, now let's see if I can, I really need to get find my new glasses. <laughs> you still ain't found those yet? Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Ephesians 6.16. 6, so, Mikey, I think this one might be a little controversial. It may upset a few people. It's yeah. a very delicate subject. Very delicate subject. So doesn't have anything. Well, it actually does have to do with abuse, doesn't it? Yes. It does have to do with abuse. And along those lines, we have a new... Re we remodeled the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I found spared no expense. That's right. I found this at the local Hobby Lobby and they were on sale. So you can all see persever perseverance, but you can't see what's below it. It says, Our greatest glory lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. So yeah. we thought that was really good. And uh, no, I did not ask Mike's permission to buy it. I went and did it on my own. <laughs> Are you usurping my God-given headship? Which is the subject of this video. Yes. So, like I said, may cause... Yeah, it's going to cause a controversy. Um, we've um, got several things here, and it might be a long one, so we might have to do it in parts. Because there's a couple of different things that we want to cover. Um, now, there's... Be delicate. Be delicate. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you know that we ha had a group on Facebook, and we want to thank the ladies who have taken it over and are handling it for us. We just didn't have the time needed to put into that. Um, but, you know, there was something that came up the past couple of days, and I just wanted to mention, I was accused of trying to castrate the men and the mid men administrators, and that's not what my intention was. I was trying to make peace between everybody. It didn't matter whether you were male or female. I was not taking anyone's side. I was only trying to make peace and bring out the point that we all have to be more tolerant of what others believe. And brothers, you have to remember that us sisters have been told our entire lives, you know, don't you question, you know, you're just a sister, you know, don't you dare question anything. So when someone raises a question and then, you know, the men immediately, you know, start, you know, well, why would you even ask that question? You know, we apparently take it the wrong way, you know, but, you know, sometimes we're a little sensitive about that. But I just wanted to mention that not many of you know this, but I'm just as proficient at the tomahawk as Mike is. <laughs> I haven't you know, been in any competitions, but uh, even Mike will say that I throw harder than any other woman he's ever seen. That's a fact. I've never seen a woman throw a tomahawk as hard as she does. So, so the point being is that if Kim was trying to castrate men in this conversation, you would have known it. But, you know, that really got Kim and I to thinking about some things about this perceived... God given headship arrangement. And Kim and I, and in fact, we, we've actually been doing, I have been doing some research on this for, for a little while now. Yeah. And Kim and I have been quite silent on it because we wanted to get everything together because we do realize that what we're going to say in this video is something that breaks, to quote some scholars, social convention. Um, and we're going to try to do this in a very, uh, well, try to do it in a systematic way and hopefully help all of us, including the brothers, realize that the sisters are in the exact same position you are as I am, as any pastor is, that the men are. And when we go through this, we hope that you brothers will appreciate the value spiritually and the level of freedom that the sisters truly actually have in Christ. 
but I do realize that I'm probably going to get bashed by the men. And loved by the women. And loved by the women because we've all been in a cult that has hurt every aspect of our lives, but more specifically, the women have been beat on more than all others, even from the earliest of childhoods. Kim will tell you. Well, maybe this is the time to finally start talking about my well, childhood. Well, see, this is, this is brothers, you have to realize that there's a built-in trigger mechanism into these cults that does not belong to Christianity. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've never talked about my childhood. I may have mentioned a thing or two, but I just want to mention um, my dad became a witness, you know, my parents were witnesses, and um, he would beat us, and physically with a belt. He used a belt, you know, about this big, and it was very thick leather. And when he started yelling and pulled out his belt, we all knew to run because someone was in trouble. And, you know, it would go beyond just the usual spanking on the backside. I would get a belt across the face, you know, anywhere he could reach me. I was thrown against furniture several, several times. I had bruised ribs. Apparently, at one point, my wrist was broken because I have a bump right here on my wrist. And I had a little incident on a ladder back in 2007. And when I went into the emergency room, the doctor asked me, how old was I as a child when my wrist was broken? I never knew it was broken. And he says, well, that explains why I didn't heal properly. So, you know, and... I would be beat so severely and thrown against furniture that I would be bleeding. Um, you know, I've got scars all on the inside of my mouth from being backhanded, you know, because I got a fang here. So every time I was hit in the mouth, you know, it would bleed. Um, I have nosebleeds very easy. Sometimes when I get a little frisky, I have to, she reminds me, <laughs> watch my fang. <laughs> So speaking of getting frisky, no, I'm just <laughs> no, it's not the time. Um, so you know, when you have this kind of background, you know, there are times where I may be a little defensive, and I'm not trying to make excuses for no. myself. What I'm trying to do is explain to ones who never had this background that you get very defensive, and you know, anything that you take as a threat. Immediately, your hackles go up. Even if it's perceived and it's not there. Yeah. You know, there's been times where Mike has just been talking to me and, you know, he's kind of, you know how he can be. You know, he's not, no, he's yeah. not really angry. He can no. just get a little riled, I you just, know. I just have a very powerful voice. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I it was, shows. and I was backed up against the counter in the kitchen and, you know, I kind of felt, uh, you know, and I wasn't being, you know, from my perspective, I wasn't being threatening. Well, I took it as a threat and uh, broke a coffee mug on his hand. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I'm not proud yeah. of that because I'm not a violent person. No. Um, there's been times where I've actually pushed people away from oh, me. Oh, yeah. Well, even um, in the Kingdom Hall, remember? Well, I was going to say an elder. Um, he backed me up against a wall and wanted to hug me and was feeling me up. And I pushed him away. I wish I would have need, to, need him in the nuts, yeah. you know. But the thing is, is I don't, you know, when you have this background, you know, you defend yourself. You defend yourself. Now, for the sisters, you have to realize that from the perspective of a man, especially one that used to serve as an elder, he had all of this authority given to him. And we know due to some very high testosterone levels, some men like to, well, whip it out and have a go at it. And you have to realize, sisters, that these men that come out of Watchtower have also had every aspect of their life taken away. Here they've got this, you know, perceived God-given authority. You wake up to the truth and, oh my God, now I get nothing. What do, what do I believe now? So for the men, they have to really redefine what they believe, how they're going to believe it, whether they're going to believe it or not. And when these guys want to go back and forth doing this, back off and just let the men, uh, you know, tire themselves out. Because when that testosterone level dro drops, 
they'll go take a nap. It's just as simple as that. But the thing is, is brothers and sisters, you really, I feel you really need to pay attention to what we're going to expose here because this it was is all eye opening for me. It, it, yeah. I mean, I started doing this and started sharing this with Kim. It's like, oh my God, I never looked at it from this perspective. And when we go through this, I hope you brothers will appreciate what the scriptures are truly saying. And I hope that the sisters will will allow the men to have their testosterone fights. <laughs> That's all I can say. Because I'm I'm not like that uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. At least at least I hope I'm not. But what I want to do is I want to start with something that is a built-in trigger mechanism to show the control that Watchtower will enforce upon a man. Okay? And it's not and women. Right. Well, yeah, but by extension, it's it's brought over to the women. But what I want to do is I also want to show how what Watchtower is using in a set of scriptures is taken totally out of context and they build this whole headship arrangement over and it's just simply not in the Bible if you view the Bible from the viewpoint of a book that is for the children that belong to freedom okay if you're not a child of freedom then you'll use this book to act to really um, put a noose around a person's neck including women and enslave them and enslave them but if you look at it from the perspective of freedom then men and women are now equal. So I'm going to, hopefully we can develop this. I know I've got a lot more because I've actually done a lot more of the research and I've shared it with her. And if you saw what our desk looked like right now, I've got open volumes and I've got closed volumes. I mean, it's just. I can't even see my printer. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, I did just so much research material here. So, but what I want to do first is I want to show the trigger mechanism that Watchtower uses to get a man to cut his hair short. And what they do is they go to the scripture. Now let me, now all of us know when you, you're out in service, you find the Bible study, the guy's got long hair, maybe a beard, um, you know, you'll study with him and then all of a sudden he, you get him to go to the meetings like you're encouraged to do. And all of a sudden he's coming to Thursday night meetings and he said, you know, my, I think I'd like to give a Bible. You know, I'm a pretty good reader. And then the Bible study conductor say, well, you know, we would love to have you join the school, but you know, the thing is, is the Bible is very specific about dress and grooming. And let me just share this scripture with you in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because this is the one they always use. Yeah. Oh, and he's done all the research, but I'm bringing something to the table too. I have Samuel Hurd's talk <laughs> yeah. about theocratic sisters. And there's a good one in there that goes right along with this discussion. Yeah. So they'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and then they'll pick out one little verse. Uh, let me see if I can find it here real quick. Uh, Did you lose your place? Yeah, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace for him? See, what Watchtower does is they use one little scripture out of context to get the man to cut his hair short so that he could fit Watchtower social convention. See, there's a very logical reason why Watchtower does this. And through a conversation with Mark Latham, thank you, Mark, I actually I actually couldn't connected a few more dots, but when Mark went into the military, he had his head shaved and he was asked by the instructors, Do you know why we did this? No, sir. We did it because we steal your identity then we can reprogram you. And those of us that went through the Elvis Presley era, we all remember the news reels when Elvis Presley, you know, got his hair shaved. All that gorgeous hair gone. They steal your identity so they can reprogram you. And this is how it works. You're mine, maggot! See, we all know what the drill... So this is all part of the logical reasons why Watchtower has the men shave their head and their beards because they steal your identity. This is the control mechanism. Well, didn't you say there's also a logical part where I, the 
why the beards have to go. Yes, and for the most logical reason why the beard has to go has nothing to do with how it's perceived in the business world. It's how it's perceived from a military aspect because, and, and I, I actually had prepared a lot of information on this, but I just haven't had time to do it. This is appropriate because this is all tying, tying in together. From a military perspective, it's very logical to have the men's face clean shaven. Because during World War II, this is when the beards truly come off the face of military men because their faces could not properly seal with the gas mask. Because for the first time in human history, you have an absolute chemical warfare. I'm not talking about what the United States military did to the Indians with, um, you know, with their um, pur smallpox. purposely infecting blankets with smallpox. This is different. So m the military men had to go around clean shaven because otherwise the gas mask would not properly seal the face. So the logical reasons why Watch how it does this is because it has to do with absolute control. That's why Watch does Taking it. Taking your identity away. They steal your identity. And that's what they've done to women, too. Yes, it's exactly what they've done to women. So now, where do we go from here, dear? Well, I don't know. You've got the reasoning book there because some of this we're going to be taking from yeah. the reasoning book. Okay, so let's just go to the reasoning book. Where do we want to go here for? Why don't we go here first? <laughs> well, I don't know. Why don't we go here first? Well, it's your research. You know, I know. Where, first of all, where are your notes? I know. Well, that I'm is what you need. trying to speak from the heart. <laughs> um, so since we're talking about the headship arrangement. Let's go to what Watchtower says about yes. this. Yes. I'm going to take some of this information from the reasoning from the scriptures book because when you go to the insight on the scriptures. It's on page 431. When you go to the insight of the scriptures and look up headship. Um, you lost your place. Please. Yeah, I did. Uh, there is actually headship. You will see that they've got all of this and all the way down here. So they've got pretty much you know, a page and a quarter on headship. And trust me, they've got a few paragraphs on the women's place. And of course, if you've been at Jehovah's Witnesses, you know how Watchtower sells that whole headship arrangement. Now, it's interesting. If you go to the Interpreter's Bible Dictionary, there's absolutely no subheading or subject titled headship it's, it's just not here interesting interesting That's real scholars interesting so the headship arrangement according to these people doesn't exist all oh, but I know I know the brothers are saying but what about this scripture what about that scripture the first thing that they'll go to is Timothy and they will say well see Paul clearly lines out or lays out the headship arrangement he does not women to preach in the congregations well, it's interesting that when you go and do any really scholarly work on the book, the letters of Timothy, or what they call the, um, the, um, yeah, I've got so many notes, it's pathetic. <laughs> it's called the pastoral epistles. And the scholars are in absolute disagreement as to who wrote Timothy. Because this is what they say. It is sometimes difficult to relate the incidents the pastorals describe, such as a church in Crete, a Crete, excuse me, mentioned in Timothy. Uh, excuse me, mentioned in I better put my glasses on. Excuse me. Mentioned in Titus <laughs> to the history of Paul's missionary work as recorded in Acts. Okay? There is evidence in their letters of a church structure that seems to have been too highly developed to have come from Paul's lifetime. Now remember, we're talking about the book of Timothy. The pastorals contain vocabulary and style that does not seem to match what we otherwise know 
of Paul. Much evidence, however, supports the traditional view of Paul's authorship. So even the scholars are, are still debating whether Paul wrote these letters or not. But here's the thing. In the letter to the Philippians, Paul said, train your perceptive powers to distinguish between right and wrong. And this is what I always go back to. Christ said, you will know the truth, and the truth will enslave you. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. Christ said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And this is why Kim and I talk from the perspective of freedom. If you're going to use the Bible to enslave people, then that's what you're going to read into the Bible. If you're going to use the Bible to set people free, then that's what you're going to claim me of doing. You're just reading this into the Bible. But yet, here in the book of Timothy, where Paul is allegedly saying, you know, I desire the women not to preach and teach. When you do your real research on that, you will see what was happening is that men and women were already creeping into the congregations and preaching a different thing. You had women coming into the congregations preaching things that they were not taught to preach. And this structure had to be stopped. Because remember, guys, the Apostle Paul said the apostasy is all ready at work in some of his work. Well, am I getting ahead of you or because I don't see your notes. So I, I don't know, know. I know. But you went in to mention what the women were actually doing about the head covering. Yeah, well, this yeah, this is where I'm going to go next, um, because when you when you look at the scriptures in first Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to read those. And I'm taking this all. I'm taking a lot of this from my um, archaeological Bible dictionary because you won't see this in Watchtower lit literature. Because once a sister reads this, then it's like, oh my God, this is this problems. is problems. So, First Corinthians chapter eleven, and we'll start at verse three. He says, "Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man." And the head of Christ is God. Well, here again, there's a reference to these headship arrangement. But what a lot of people, scholars, recognize that what Paul is referring to, not the headship arrangement, but the order of creation. See, there, see, there's different ways of looking at this if you want to. Okay? But he goes on to say, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. He's not dishonoring Christ. He's dishonoring himself. Okay? And every woman who prays or prophesies, whoops, women praying? And prophesying? And prophesying in the church? Wait a minute. Synagogues? Wait a minute. That can't be right. I got to write a letter to Timothy and stop this. See? Do you see how when he writes to the Corinthians and then he writes to the Timothy, now Paul's saying two different things. That's why there's a huge debate as to whether Paul really wrote Timothy or not. Because right here, women are prophesying. Women are praying in the church setting. But I'm going to go on. Trust me, I'm going to go on. Did you poke your eye on that one? Yes, I did. Okay. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off, and and if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from women, but women from man. Neither was man created for women, but women for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, the women ought to have a sign of authority. Now, isn't it interesting that when any cult uses this set of scriptures, they, don't, they do not go any further. Why? They don't research it either. They don't research it. Because now, let me do a little bit of research. as it's, And trust me, friends, trust me. The Imperial Bible Dictionary pretty much says 
the very same thing. Interpreters. Yeah, yeah, yeah interpreters. It. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. I appreciate that. I don't want to get anything wrong on this subject. Okay. So now we're going to look down here and see what archaeology has to say about what Paul's saying right here. Real scholars. Okay. So chapter 11, and we're going to be um, what the scholars say that pertain to verses 5 and 6. Based on their newfound freedom in Christ, women in the Corinth church were praying and prophesying. Where? Where were they praying and prophesying? In the congregation or church? In the congregation. Because that's part of the freedom. But see, women today can't get up and say a prayer in these cults, can they? They just can't do it. Nope. So, Christian tradition from Pentecost on had approved of such practice. So they go and recite Acts chapter 2, 17 and 18, and I found this quite interesting. Acts chapter 2. Yes, he's using the old rusty sword. Oh, now. yeah. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, 17 and 18. And this is Peter speaking, okay? And Peter is quoting from Joel. And in the last days, God says, I shall pour out some of my spirit upon every sort of flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. See? The women were given equal portions of the Holy Spirit. So, as the Archaeological Research Bible says, that from Pentecost onward, it was approved practice for women to prophesy and pray in the church setting. Okay? And it goes on to say, and it really fit Paul's emphasis on freedom. See, the emphasis in Timothy isn't on freedom, is it? It's emphasized on absolute congregational structure. So that's why a lot of scholars believe that Timothy, the letter to Timothy was written by someone else and they were Soto, Sudio, something, Paul's name. In other words, they were name dropping. Okay? Because that scripture in Timothy does not emphasize freedom like this scripture does here. Okay, so I'm going to go on. But these, were, now this is the reason why Paul is saying wear a head covering. Okay? This was interesting. Because this is the reason why. It's got nothing to do with the headship arrangement. It does not pertain to the headship. Because Peter and in Acts show that the sisters were given equal portion of that Holy Spirit. Okay? So now we're going to go on. We're going to finish what he says. But these women, as they spoke in worship, were apparently flaunting social convention by sending ambiguous signals about their sexuality or religious commitment through inappropriate hairstyles or the lack of headdresses. Paul encouraged them to exercise restraint. So now we're going to go on back up to the scripture because there's just a little bit more but I want to put this first, okay? Well, maybe even cutting their hair, since well, it says right there that well, they might it. as well shave their head. Well, see, that exactly. See, what, what the women were doing is they were following the Corinthian immoral hairstyles. And they were bringing this influence into the congregation. So Paul's saying, if you're going to do this, cover your head out of respect for the angels. It's not that the angels were more superior or that the husband was more superior, is that Paul was beginning to see some of these influences creep into the congregation, especially from those sisters that had equal portions of the Holy Spirit poured out among them. Okay, now we're going to go on. We're going to read the scripture. But I just want to backtrack just a little bit. Verse 10 says, For this reason, and because of the women, because of the angels, the women ought not... The women ought to have a sign of authority on their head. In the Lord, however, women is not independent of man, 
nor is man independent of women. That kind of shoots the headship thing. They're equal. See, think about this. Go back to the blessing in the Garden of Eden when God created women. He took the rib from the man and created women. And when he brought him together, he says, and, and in the marriage arrangement, he says, for this reason, a man will leave a woman, man of, uh, uh, a man parents. will leave his parents, find a wife, I'm trying to go off from memory, and the two shall become, the two shall become one flesh. If you're one flesh, where's the headship arrangement in that? The headship arrangement is found in the curse after the sin. That's where you see the headship arrangement. But if you really analyze this, guys and sisters, when this Holy Spirit was poured out upon the women and they were given equal portions, that curse, that part of the curse was lifted. Because these women were now praying and prophesying inside the congregations. But I'm going to go on with the reading. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But in everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for woman to pray to God with her hair uncovered, with her head uncovered? See, now we go on to why, here's the trigger mechanism. But does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? So now, in context, if these anointed brothers and sisters were beginning to follow social convention in Corinth and bringing these styles into the congregation, then the men were also bringing in social convention from the sexual aspect. Were they letting their hair grow all the way down to their ass so they could be like a woman? Were they wearing women wigs? I don't know. This is not touched about. But in context, Paul's talking about the social, sexual, immoral influences that were being brought into the congregation and the men were following them too. So this is why he says, does not the very nature of things teach you that a man with long hair? This tells me this has absolutely nothing to do with Watchtower's headship. Nothing. You know. Because Watchtower's taking it out of, out of context. And trust me, sisters, Watchtower knows every bit of this. Have you seen their libraries? Well, hell, hell, they even tried to hide the fact that they became a member of the United Nations so they could get a library card. Well, what do you think is in the UN library? It's this stuff. Old also. books. Old <laughs> books. Exactly. They're available online, too. So he goes on. Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. See? For long hair is given to her as a covering. You mean our hair is our covering? We don't need a hat or veil? Exactly. See, Paul is saying, But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. See, and this is what Paul was getting at. Sisters, your hair is your head covering from God. But if you follow so, and I'm just doing Paul. I'm trying to help you understand what Paul is saying here. Sisters, your long hair is your head covering. This is what glorifies you in front of Christ and God and even the angels. But if you're going to shave your head, you're taking that glory away from yourself. If you're going to do that, then you need to put a head covering on so that you can, so that you can re remain with that level of glory. Okay? But Paul goes on to say, verse 16, and I say this to all the brothers out there. If, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. You have to realize, sisters, that when any cult tries to push this bull crap of wearing a veil, you have to realize that they're taking this out of context because what Paul is speaking about, according to the people that do real research work, that the influence of this, that women and men were flaunting their sexual, their sexual immorality that was um, in the culture, social convention, that was related to Corinth at that time. So do we want to stop it here and go to part two? We could. Okay. Join us on part two.